In today's class, we'll be discussing media. And so what is the media? Well, think about it. You consume media on a daily basis. If it's watching Netflix, watching the news, reading a newspaper, looking through a magazine, going to Disneyland, these are all forms of media. And what we want to understand about media is that it begins to shape our understanding of the social world. It begins to shape our behaviors. It begins to influence our lives in ways that we may have not necessarily directly noticed. We start to think about how we consume media. Well, think about listening to the radio. I'm a huge fan of 93.5 K-Day. If anyone's ever listened to K-Day, it's old school hip hop and also some modern day hip hop. On K-Day, it tailors to a particular audience, individuals who enjoy hip hop and hip hop from the 90s and 2000s. But in addition to that, think about the commercials that are released on K-Day as opposed to commercials that are on KISS FM or commercials that are on Power 106, et cetera, et cetera. This idea that through media, through the radio, messages are consistently relayed to you. Think about surfing the internet. You log on to Yahoo and all the stories that pop up, all the different sublinks that pop up to take you to different websites. Or even just look at Instagram. The idea that Instagram now offers all these different ads that can gain your interest, gain your potential business by simply swiping up or clicking on the image. Think about how much time you spend on a daily basis consuming media and the extensive reach that media offers. This idea that when YouTube started, you could watch videos back to back to back with no interruptions. Try that today. You'll be bombarded with advertisements saying your video will start and then in the right hand corner, you see the countdown because they understand where consumers are. They understand that people are spending a considerable amount of time consuming or viewing media, that that's the best way to reach them. What we want to understand is that media serves as one of the major social institutions in society, and it's not exclusive to American society. This form of social institution exists throughout the world. And its power and its importance, especially in the digital age, increases on a daily basis. And so as we start to think about media, think about all the different forms of media that you're going to consume today. How much time will you spend on Facebook if you have Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram? What's interesting about iPhones and iP iPads nowadays is that they'll show you how you're spending your time. They'll provide these miniature bar graphs that say that for the seven hours that you were on your device, you're consuming this app as opposed to this app. Well, I want you to think about that. What else could we possibly be doing outside of relying on our cell phone or a tablet or a laptop for entertainment, especially during this time of quarantine? And I assume another stay at home order um, will occur pretty soon. We want to understand the media's relationship with a democratic society, with a democratic 
system of government. The media serves in many ways as the voice of the people. And so you want to keep that in mind. This idea that the media, at least in the United States, holds certain rights, holds certain privileges, where they can hold individuals accountable, where they can conduct research to try to uncover or discover something that is occurring within our government. The idea that the media serves as a tool, as an instrument for social change. Think about the power of Instagram. Think about the power of Snapchat and how these forms of social media have shaped the Black Lives Matter movement. Think about how the, these forms of media have allowed individuals to communicate, to develop strategies, to re relay a message to the masses rapidly, to express frustration as you turn on your television screen and you see news channels, for example, at the sites of the protests. The media can communicate the message, the media can serve as an instrument for change, but at the same time, if in authoritarian or totalitarian type governments where freedom does not exist, the media can serve as an instrument for the states. The media can push propaganda. And so I want you to think about that. Think about the fact that the early American leaders understood the importance of providing individuals with updates, providing individuals with news as a tool to educate the general public, to mobilize citizens, to develop that passion and that interest among the citizenry. Now, I want to caution about simply educating yourself directly from the media, from the news networks. Obviously, there is a degree of bias. There is a degree of sensationalism. Which story is the sexiest to run with? What I encourage students to do is to consume media, to read articles, to watch the news, but at the same time, be critical. At the same time, be prepared to develop your own opinion. Politically, I'm more moderate in my beliefs. There are some issues where I'm more conservative, but I tend to be more liberal than conservative in my beliefs, but I identify somewhere in the middle. I consider myself an independent. Well, when I consume news, what I try to do is have a balance. So I'll listen to or watch CNN and Fox News. Because CNN will tell me one thing, and then on the same topic, Fox News will have a twist. And then I make a comparison in my mind and I develop my own opinion. We don't want to be sheep. We don't want to follow the herd. We don't want to just assume that things are true or accurate because a talking head on the television told us 
to believe their words or to trust their words. I want you to think about the impact of having a free press, the voice of the people. That is something that we oftentimes take for granted in the United States. We have political leaders who call the press the enemy of the people. Is it because the press holds individuals accountable? Is it because the press is not writing necessarily the most positive stories? See, the press is not the enemy of the people. The press is a tool for the people. Because imagine if you had to go to Washington, D.C. and try to do all this research yourself on a daily basis. It would be nearly impossible. It would be overwhelming. So the press simplifies. And once again, it's our job to be able to cipher between what is reported on this station and that station. And then we draw our own opinions. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States includes a guarantee of the freedom of expression and the freedom of the press. And what we want to understand about the freedoms that are guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution is that although we have these freedoms, it does not state that we have the freedom of consequence or from consequence. Meaning that if the press releases a false story, they, there are consequences associated with that. They have the opportunity to retract that story or face a lawsuit. Freedom of expression. You have the ability to share whatever opinion you have, but understand that opinion can carry consequences with it. And so I just wanted to touch on that briefly. When we talk about the press, especially in relation to a democratic society, particularly the United States, what we want to understand is that the press or the media serves in some way as the fourth estate of government. If we recall the other three estates, the other three branches of government, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And just as those other three branches of government are there to supposedly serve as a checks and balances of power, we can argue that the media does the same, that the press does the same, that it provides that checks and balances of power to the three branches, the executive, judicial, legislative. The idea that the media has the power to independently begin to examine political leaders. Where are they getting their donations from? How are they spending those political donations? What are the beliefs of this individual? Is this individual corrupt? That's the type of information that the media has a potential to provide us with. To help us understand policies that are being adopted or created. What we want to understand about the media is that in many ways, as a checks and balances, it ensures that no particular branch amasses too much power. That we have individuals in office who are not incompetent, who are not engaged in malfeasance in some way. And so an honest media, a media that does not skew reality, 
can be beneficial to the American public. Now let's change our tune a little bit. And let's start looking at the structures of media industries. And we have what we call a conglomeration. And the conglomerations, when a single business, when a single co a corporation acquires a variety of otherwise unrelated businesses. So you have a movie studio, for example, that purchases a publishing company for books and magazines. They then go and they purchase a television broadcasting station or radio broadcasting station. They then go and buy cable network, right? They go buy movie theaters, they go buy record labels, they now are into video game distribution. They buy websites, the most popular websites out there are social media sites. Perhaps they go and they buy a theme park or even a sports franchise. I want you to think about this. Think about Disney as a conglomeration. Disney Studios starts off making cartoons. They make nature films, but everything pretty much revolves around the film industry early on. Well, Disney owns has a radio station. Disney has several Disney channels. They own ABC. They own ESPN. Disney, I believe, has a record label or at least a record label that they're associated with. Disney has released video games. They own several theme parks throughout the world. And at one point, Disney owned the Anaheim Angels, or I guess now you could say the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. So those are conglomerations when these businesses, when one entity begins to acquire other entities that are unrelated to their initial form of business or model of business. What we find in a conglomeration is that this may also be referred to as horizontal integration, where essentially a company is able to take advantage of its own organizational structure, the hierarchy of authority, the types of functions it performs. And by use, utilizing its organizational structure, they're now able to market products across a wide range of media formats and outlets. Think about it. Disney releases a new movie. They can use their radio station to promote it. They can use their television networks to promote it. They can use their theme parks to promote it. And it just increases their power, increases their influence. This is called cross-promoting, where you're able to, in many ways, use your multiple divisions within these businesses to push products, to create in many ways the synergy among the products that you're producing. See, it's mutually beneficial within our organization that is a conglomeration to utilize all of its resources because it increases their power, it increases their wealth. The idea that in many ways, a company like Disney doesn't try to convince you that you want to 
watch this movie. They convince you that you need to watch this movie. Think about when Frozen came out. Think about all the Frozen products that you saw in stores. Think about how many times you heard that Let It Go song. It wasn't just simply in the movie. It wasn't just simply on the radio. Dancing competitions adopted that song. It was everywhere. It became a household record for some. I like this image a lot because Disney's power within society is increasing on an annual basis. So because it's one of the most powerful companies in the world, why not have the Mickey ears on the globe? Let's look at some of the examples of companies and the comp uh, and not only their stake in the media industry, but the fact that the media landscape is dominated by only a handful of companies. So look at the revenue, for example, of Comcast. Right? Now this is dated. This is back to 2013. But look at the influence of these companies. Market cap, $142.7 billion for Comcast. Look at Disney, $149.2 billion. You have Time Warner, 21st Century Fox, CBS, Viacom. And then you start looking at the key properties. What do they own? Well, let's look at what Disney owns. As I mentioned before, ABC, ESPN, Disney Channels, Walt Disney Studios, Pixar. And, you know, not to, not to go too far off of this, but think about Pixar and how they were running in, or operating independently of Disney for so many years. And then we see Disney buy out Pixar. Marvel Studios, Lucasfilm, Star Wars, and of course, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. If we look at Comcast, NBC, Telemundo, MSNBC, Bravo, Universal Pictures, Universal Parks and Resorts, Comcast Cable, and Optimum, and so on and so forth. A handful of companies control more than 90% of the media that's being released. And this is just another example here of some of the companies that these major corporations own. We assume that because we could turn on the television, if we have satellite or if we have cable or if we're watching YouTube and have this cornucopia this massive array of media choices, but in many ways that's deceiving. Because in reality, many of the brands, many of the labels, many of the channels that we're watching or that we're consuming are just different company identities within the same larger structure. The idea that there are very few independent media producers that can even compete in the market today. Because once a media, a, a small independent media company achieves any type of success, they're typically purchased by a larger conglomerate. A larger company comes in and says, hey, we'd like to buy your company because the larger conglomerates are always exploring new opportunities to increase the revenues. And imagine what happens if you're one of these independent media companies and you say no to a Disney. You say no to a Comcast. What's going to happen to you? Chances are they'll try to shut you down. 
you'll steal your talents. So make sure it's impossible for you to have your movies released in movie theaters. In many ways, they'll bankrupt you. And so as an independent media company, you are going to get bullied by the big players in the game. We look at this concept of a merger. And a merger is a legal combination of two companies. And the purpose of this essentially is to maximize efficiency and increase profits by eliminating redundant infrastructure, by eliminating redundant personnel. So what does this mean? Basically, a company comes in, two similar companies, right? They create this merger, and then they start to say, okay, now we need to lay off individuals because we're going to downside. There's no need for two executive vice presidents of such and such. There's no need for 10 individuals doing such and such duties. We can cut down our staff and increase profits. We saw this in 2000 with AOL and the Time Warner merger. And then we look at this concept of concentration. And concentration is essentially the process by which a number of companies producing and distributing a particular commodity begins to decrease. There's not as much competition in the market. Concentration is a product of mergers and acquisitions that occur through the conglomeration phase. Less competition means you can have, in many ways, a stronghold on the market. As I mentioned before, 90% of all global media is controlled by a handful of companies. And these companies are known as the big five, or you refer to them as the six global media conglomerates. See, a couple of decades ago, we had 25 major media companies. Now we're down to five or six. And so you want to think about how that begins to affect the type of message that is shared. How that begins to promote this concept of consumerism. How those who control the media can easily manipulate the message to serve their agenda. And then we look at two government agencies that are in charge in many ways of regulating large conglomerates. You have the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and the SEC the Securities and Exchange Commission. So what the FCC can do is that it can establish restrictions on different media outlets. They can restrict companies growing too large and developing a monopoly in any one market. Because think about it. Disney has the power as a media giant to take over all the newspapers, to take over all the television and radio stations in one particular area, not allowing for competition and only providing for one single voice to be heard, which then jeopardizes a sense of democracy, the freedom of expression. So the FCC attempts to regulate to a degree the type of monopolies that can be developed. The SEC is heavily involved in antitrust legislation. They help govern the mergers that exist between companies and they go a step further. 
than the FCC in this regard by discouraging monopolies from forming. See, what we want to understand about antitrust legislation is that it seeks ideally to maintain competition in the marketplace by prohibiting monopolies, by regulating price fixing where companies collaborate, say, hey, we're going to overcharge for this product collectively, and to limit the level of collusion that may exist between multiple businesses that could potentially exploit the general public. But what we want to understand is that deregulation, meaning that the SEC's teeth, their power to regulate industries, has either been removed or weakened in reference to the media industry. And this has allowed for companies to grow and grow and grow and develop even larger chunks of the media market. Now let's start to look at power shifts. And when we look at power shifts, we look at technology and communication companies gaining a degree of dominance within the marketplace. We're talking about companies that have recently gained a significant role of the media market. Hulu, Amazon, Netflix. Think about how these new technologies of streaming have revolutionized the media industry. And this is something very important to understand, that the power has shifted from companies that strictly produce products to now companies that distribute products. Now, you can argue that Hulu, Amazon, and Netflix are now producing their own products. That's true. But their sole function, I'm sorry, not their sole function, but their major function is to distribute content, to provide those streaming capabilities. See, what's becoming more and more clear in the digital age, in the 21st century, is that companies that provide access to entertainment and media will have a similar level of importance to the companies that actually produce the entertainment. I want you to think about the early stages of Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. If you recall, Disney allowed these streaming services to host their films for a significant amount of time, actually. And then Disney comes out with Disney Plus. And although the Disney content on Hulu, Amazon, Netflix hasn't been completely eliminated, Disney is in the process of taking sole ownership of how their films and content are distributed. Disney realized that, hey, streaming can make a significant amount of money for us. So why are we empowering these other streaming companies? I want you to think about products that are released to the public. Think about how Apple has changed its focus to a degree. At one time, Apple was consumed with solely making computers but they expanded their products and furthered their reach. You have the iPods, you have the iPads, iPhones, the Apple Watch, all of these tools that we can use to consume media. Think about how Apple created its own operating system, its own streaming player, video player, its own web browser. The idea that you can go through Apple iTunes to purchase television shows or movies or music. Think about how 
Apple wanted to control how you listen to your media. So they purchased in 2014 Beats Electronics for $2 billion. These companies are not only shaping what we watch, but how we watch or consume. Now let's go back to this concept of the FCC and really what the major role for the FCC is. See, the FCC imposes regulations on what the media can produce. And you can argue to a certain degree, the FCC does limit the notion of absolute freedom of expression. The debate that has to occur is, what is the government's role in censorship? Can you produce anything you want in the media under the umbrella of freedom of expression and have it protected by the Constitution? Well, what we've consistently seen is that the freedom of expression is oftentimes challenged in court by the FCC as it attempts to regulate the content that is produced by arguing that freedom of expression is limited, especially in the cases where material is considered obscene. But what qualifies as obscene material? And what we want to understand is that the framework, the foundation for what is considered obscene stems back from the 1959 Supreme Court decision in Roth versus the US. And in this ruling, the court found that child pornography and other material which deals with sex right, can be considered obscene. Well, what we want to understand is that although we do have a general consensus in American society, that child pornography is obscene, that child pornography is wrong, that child pornography is illegal. As we begin to branch out to the other forms of sexuality with, and sexual expression within our society, that is between consult, consenting adults, it becomes a bit more blurry. It becomes harder for people to, to have a general consensus as to what is considered obscene. So that line that needs to be drawn between what is obscene and what is it is very hard to draw at times. The FCC then uses this power as a regulating force to provide ratings and warnings. In 1968, we see the Motion Picture Association of America establishing movie ratings from G to PG to PG-13 to R to NC-17, which essentially means that material that is unfit for anyone under the age of 17 And this can hold pornographic material or other types of adult materials. In 1985, we see the recording industry, Association of America, placing warning stickers on albums because the albums referred to drugs, they referred to sex, violence, and other objectionable subjects. In 1993, the Entertainment Software Rating Board starts to implement rating systems for video games 
based on their age appropriateness. And in 1997, we start seeing the rating system on television programs. And you'll see, for example, T, or you'll see V for violence or, or uh, mature, whatever it may be. And it's warning us about the violence of sex, the offensive language that may be used. Now, you may be wondering about, well, how is this a violation of freedom of expression? Well, I want you to think about that. Who's doing the judgments? Can those individuals hold prejudices or biases and allow those prejudices and biases to influence what type of rating systems or ratings are awarded to particular types of media. In addition to that, what I want you to take into consideration is if you're, go back to when you were 15, 16, 17. If you wanted to go see a rated R movie, what we want to understand is that not all movie theaters would follow the strict rating systems. And some might allow us to go and watch a rated R movie, while others follow these policies strictly. What if you have your permission of your parent to go watch a rated R movie, shouldn't you have the freedom to do so, regardless of your age, without having your parent present to purchase those tickets for you? This is where that discussion on freedom starts. Think about it, even video games, depending if whether or not the place is enforcing policies related to the FCC ratings, you may go in trying to buy the new Grand Theft Auto or whatever, and they may refuse to sell it to you or may ask for an ID. Now let's look at culture and consumption of the media. And we look at high, low, and popular culture. We have what we call culture wars. And culture wars involve the audience, they involve the appropriateness of the material, right? Once again, it's relative to who's doing the judgment. And what we can argue in public, popular culture is that it's oftentimes in a contrast with the high culture of elite groups. Pop culture is a form of expression that's usually associated with the masses, with everyday consumer goods, with commercial products. And high culture is typically cultural expression that's associated with the elite or the dominant classes. And Pop culture in many ways threatens the position of the elites by challenging their influence, by challenging their preferences, by challenging the value that they place on certain types of culture, certain types of media. Think about how high culture and pop culture is a complex system of taste and aesthetics. Think about how hip hop and how rap are not only an example of pop culture, but have historically challenged the status quo. Think about when NWA released Fuck the Police. Granted, radio stations were editing the lyrics, but if you had the ability to go buy that cassette, and you hear, fuck the police as one, is the, one of the opening lines of the record. Think about how that sent a cultural shock. Think about how hip hop evolved and at times still maintains a degree of social consciousness depending on who you listen to but how in the 90s in particular, 
the experience of street credibility was one of the most important qualifications. Who was able to express that they were the tougher person, that they had a rougher life, right? That they maybe had a background of drugs and violence and gangs and et cetera. The idea that this was appealing. What we want to understand about hip hop and rap is that the larger consumers, largest consumer group of hip hop and rap are not ethnic and racial minority communities, it's white suburban America. Because people want to envision living on the streets. People want to envision the gang life. They want to envision living in the hood without ever having to step foot in the hood. As I travel around the United States and I tell individuals I grew up in East LA, people will ask me, well, did you dodge bullets? How'd you get out from joining a gang? How did you not sell drugs? Well, although those factors do exist in the community, that's not the entire community. But think about how the media promotes East Los Angeles. Think about how the media promotes Compton. As I mentioned before, people like the idea of what Compton looked like in the 90s. They just never want to step foot or live in Compton. And that feeds to further stereotypes that individuals who are consuming this media may hold. What we want to understand is that high culture and pop culture are often times permeable. Which means how we categorize a particular type of art can change over time. I'm a huge fan of hip hop. I worked in the music industry. I worked with hip hop artists. I make the distinction, for example, between what qualifies as hip hop and what qualifies as rap music. I have my hierarchy of hip hop artists. In no particular order, the Nas, the Rock Hymns, right? I like the Lupe Fiascos, the Comms, the Talib Qualis, the Black Thoughts, as opposed to my dislike for artists like Drake, for artists like Little Uzi, all these individuals, if I must, Takashi, don't like his music at all. But this hierarchy that exists within the music industry, within the hip hop and or rap industry, between high and pop culture. Think about Shakespeare. Shakespeare may be one of the pinnacles of high culture. And think about how certain directors or films today may be an example of high culture. The Godfather, for example. A cinematic masterpiece. As opposed to other films that are produced on a similar topic. And then let's wrap up with this discussion on taste and meaning. When we understand, what we need to understand about high and pop culture is that it depends on the characteristics of the audience. Differences in class, in education, race or ethnicity, religion. Well, that will help define what qualifies as pop culture and high culture. We have what we call taste publics. And those are groups of people who share a similar artistic, literary, media, recreational, intellectual interest. And we have taste cultures. Taste cultures are area of cult areas of culture that share similar aesthetics and standards of taste. Let's give you an example of that. Members of the upper class are more likely to 
let's say, own abstract paintings that are hanging in their homes. They have the financial means to do so. Well, individuals in the working class or the lower class or the middle class, right, rather than placing these very abstract, very expensive paintings on the wall, our walls may be full of family portraits. What we want to understand is that the music, the movies, the clothes, clothes, the foods that we eat, the art that we consume, the books that we read, the magazines that we browse through, the cars that we drive, the sports that we watch, the television shows that we enjoy watching, are in many ways influenced by our social position within society. And we'll talk about that more um, when we start covering the topics in chapter nine.